Hi, I'm Father Chris Ayler with the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, and it's an honor to have you with us here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy and on EWTN for Living Divine Mercy. You know, there's a lot of misunderstanding regarding plenary indulgences going all the way back to the Middle Ages. You know, they are not rules or regulations as many people think they are, but rather I call extra credit of grace that we can get for a holy soul or for ourselves. We are Yes, indulgences may have been misused in the past by a few rogue priests, but it was never church teaching to sell them or permit the misuse of them. You know, anything good can be misused at any time, such as a computer to view something immoral or a knife to harm someone. But that doesn't make all computers and all knives bad. It is the same with indulgences. So, what is a plenary indulgence? Well, plenary means full, and indulgence, which used to mean to be kind, later came to mean remission of a debt. And in Roman times, it even meant release from punishment. It is now commonly defined as the remission of the temporal punishment due to sin that has already been forgiven. Okay, so what does all that mean? In the sacrament of penance, our sins are forgiven, and so is the eternal punishment due to sin. In other words, we no longer face the fires of hell. But there still may be some temporal punishment required by divine justice, and atonement for this must be fulfilled either in the present life or in the world to come, for example, in purgatory. We know this because Revelation 21, 27 says that nothing unclean will enter the presence of God. So here's the point. If a person goes to confession and has a valid confession, as we've said in other shows, the sins are forgiven, but some temporal punishment may remain. For example, a man may confess abusing alcohol. He is forgiven in the confessional, but there are still consequences for what he has done because he has hurt himself and others, and he has scarred the body of Christ. And this has to be repaired. And some will say, but Jesus died for my sins and there's nothing I need to do now. Yes, Jesus died for all humanity as all people have been redeemed by Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. But, as we've said before, not all humanity will be saved. Jesus won that grace for our salvation on the cross, but we need to fully cooperate with that grace, and that includes being purified and cleansed, not just forgiven. The Bible is clear that there are consequences to sins even after we are forgiven. <clears throat> Remember David's firstborn son died as a result of his sin with Bathsheba, and Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land after his sin of mistrust when he hit the rock twice in the desert. So although they were both forgiven of their sins, there was a loving punishment uh, or discipline from God for what they had done. And as we say, the wound is healed, that's the forgiveness, but the scar remains, that's the consequences. But God is so loving, so merciful, he can, even in these cases, give a way for us to heal the scar. Not just the wound and confession, but the scar of the consequences. According to passages such as Matthew 16, 19 and John 20, 23, Christ has delegated his authority to his church. So the church has the authority to give plenary indulgences. She has the power to distribute graces that place at the penitent's disposal 
the merits of Jesus Christ and the saints, which come from the treasury of the church. This has always been this way in the church. It's God's gift to the church. You know, St. Faustina tells us something amazing. She tells us that Jesus said, quote, the souls in purgatory are greatly loved by me. They are making retribution to my justice. It is in your power to bring them relief. Draw all the indulgences from the treasury of my church. Wow. As members of the body of Christ, our prayers can do a lot. So while we call this punishment, it is really loving purification. Now, if you are like me, <laughs> I want a way out of all temporal punishment to wash myself clean in the mercy of God. And there is a way. Jesus gave us Divine Mercy Sunday to be forgiven of all sin and punishment on that one day of the year. We've talked about that on past shows. Praise be to God. That is the most recommended way. However, there is something you can do every day of the year to be washed clean, not only of all sin, but all punishment due to sin, and that is through plenary indulgences. So now, let's give some examples. There are hundreds of ways that we can earn indulgences, but I like to start with what I call the big four plenary indulgences. I call them that because they are the ones that you can do any day of the year and in any place. So any day, any time. The first is praying the rosary inside a church or chapel or with another person. The second, is by walking the Stations of the Cross, not in your bedroom, but in a legally erected place like a church. The third is 30 minutes of adoration, adoring our Lord. And remember, the Blessed Sacrament can be exposed in a monstrance on the altar or simply reposed in the tabernacle. The grace is the same. And finally, the fourth is you can do this one on your couch at halftime, and that is reading 30 minutes of scripture. So each day of the year, we can do any one of these. Now, remember, we can only get one plenary indulgence per day. Now, there is one more part to this. There are conditions that we have to fulfill for each plenary indulgence we do. First, we must receive Holy Communion for each plenary indulgence we do. Second, we need to go to confession. Now, many people still think that it is eight days before or after we do the indulgence that we go, can go to confession, but the church now teaches that we need to go to confession about 20 days before or after the indulgence. Going before if you're not in a state of grace, or if you are, you can go up to 20 days after. So you don't need to go to confession for each individual indulgence, but one confession suffices for all indulgences done during those 40 days, you know, up to 20 days before or up to 20 days after. Hopefully you got, you're getting all this. Now, third, we need to pray for the intentions of the Holy Father, which can normally be done with an Our Father, Hail Mary, and a Glory Be. Now, this is not his own personal intentions, but those issued by the church for each month of the year, and they are always in line with church teaching. And then finally, the big one, we can have no attachment to sin, even venial. Uh, as I always say, <laughs> this one is not easy, but don't worry. If you are not perfectly detached from sin and don't get a plenary indulgence, you will still get a partial indulgence where some of the temporal punishment due to sin is remembered. Well, this might not sound like a lot, but remember, pennies equal dollars. So there are many ways we can relieve our own punishment after death or the punishment of our deceased loved ones to help release them for purgatory. This is important. Now, praying for the dead has always been part of the Christian life. It's been done by Christians since the first centuries. 
In fact, the second book of Maccabees tells us that we need to pray for the dead. The Jews believe that it was, quote, a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from sins. That's second Maccabees. And remember, indulgences are not requirements. But again, as I said, extra credit of grace. Grace so powerful that it might make a huge difference for us or a loved one after death. So as we said, plenary indulgences help heal the spirit, our souls. But as humans, we're also physical. We have emotions. Now let's hear a great story about a therapeutic writing center that helps bring healing. This is the story of Equine Dreams. For me, I feel God when I'm here. There's not a day that I don't feel the love and the just soft warmth of his spirit. And it's just, it's just something that can't be explained. Jesus is here at this property. He, they feel the love and the acceptance. This is Jesus' home. This is where he brings them to love them unconditionally. Everything here is given up to the Lord and the children feel that. They don't feel conditions. This Illinois farm is called Equine Dreams and its creation was inspired by the story of Andrew. This is Andrew's brother. It's passion, it's heart, it's love and uh, deep love. He is a gift to us. He teaches us, he breaks down the barriers and in the world that, you know, blind you from what others need. He's a living testimony that there is need in the world. And this is Andrew. He was born with Angelman syndrome, a genetic condition that affects his intellectual abilities, his speech and his balance. And to have our professionals, our physicians, our peers, or people who are helping us through these difficulties say, mm, put him away. It's gonna ruin your family. It's gonna break your family apart. I was angry with everything. I was angry at uh, the system. Scared, surviving, and trying to help Andrew be the best he could be. Sharon remembers a day she went to church to pray and her anger found a new target. And I just needed to sit with the Lord and the door was locked. Oh, that just made me so angry. That God, it was all his fault. It was raining. I remember kneeling in the grass, crying, thinking, really, and now you're going to lock the door? I was very angry at him. And a deacon once told me, it's because you were so angry that, you know, your faith was so strong. You don't get angry at people you don't care about. And I, and that, I clung to that. One of the things that helped me so much with my anger, it, was God doesn't make mistakes. Jesus doesn't make mistakes. And you start recognizing that there's a journey there of faith when you're giving everything that's hopeless to the Lord. Needing to find respite, Sharon drew on her childhood past in Iowa. She bought a horse. She rode it to clear her mind, but soon it became the family horse. And then the remarkable happened. Andrew responded to its presence in ways that traditional therapies had never been able to reach. Perhaps, her family thought, others could benefit from this special brand of medicine. The evolution of equine dreams is so interesting. You know, it started with my mother and one horse and my brother and my family, and it just evolved. It took off like wildfire. We had a handful of volunteers that came from the colleges that were pursuing vocations in uh, different health sciences, audiology, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy. We wear our faith like a badge and we have the strength to push through and persevere and have mercy and forgiveness and allow people to come in when they're broke, you know, when they're weak, when they're sad, when they're tired and know that feeling. We know that feeling here. Andrew did that for us. He strengthened our relationship with Christ. So I found that just with the working with the horses over time, that it was like God was actually working on my heart. I started to realize this amazing ability that they have to, um, to read emotions. They're like a mirror almost, like a mirror of your soul. We have seen um, people who had stopped speaking because of 
trauma and abuse and sad, sad situations, speak to a horse before a person. Breaking that silence is pretty, pretty huge. That's temporally and cognitively huge. People with PTSD or trauma, all the things that are not of heaven, they're human feelings. And how we can navigate through those with our faith. They have to go deeper. Horses help you go deeper. Equine Dreams tailors its day to match its visitors. That could mean relating to wildlife, grooming a horse, or riding a simulator before trying the real thing. When you're feeling scared and you walk through that to ride your horse, when you're walking through that fear, that's bravery. Are you brave? Yes. Yes, let's do it. Equine Dreams has expanded to a bigger location, but its 26-year mission is unchanged. It is in the business of healing. To aid in that mission, these prayer paths lead to a safe space known as the Mary Garden. The word for church, or the word uh, ecclesia in Greek, or iglesia in Spanish, actually doesn't mean the building, but it means the people of God, who are the living stones that are building up the church. And that's kind of the beautiful balance here, is that there's this freedom of saying, wherever you're at in your journey, you are always welcome. Rick and company also go on the road, taking miniature horses to day programs, nursing homes, and children's hospital wards. Across all their services, they reach about 1,000 clients and hope to grow even more. And their fee? No charge for any of this, ever. This thing that we're running takes so much, so much. And it just continues to be provided to us. To me, divine mercy is active love. It's not passive. And I think ultimately the spirit of charity is the spirit of love. And I think that when people come together as a group and they are nourished by sharing of that love, I think that the faith just comes. A deep love of faith, of family, of community. Not a bad combination to bring hope to those who seek it, one encounter at a time. As we described, a big part of plenary indulgences is intercessory prayer. Now let's go back to the Bible, to one of my favorite passages about intercessory prayer. Mark 2, verses 1 through 12, tells the story of Jesus healing the paralytic. Because of the crowds, the man's friend lowered his pallet down through an opening in the roof. For the paralyzed man lowered down to Jesus through the roof, it is not primarily his fate that opens the floodgates of Christ's healing love, but the fate of his companions. The sick man was unable to find either physical healing or the forgiveness of his sins on his own. He needed companions who would bring him to Jesus. Only then could he be fully open and able to experience the merciful love of God. There are no self-sufficient Christians we rely on one another's prayers, encouragement, spiritual counsel, and practical help. Indeed, St. Faustina reminds us of Christ's command to exercise toward one another the three degrees of mercy. The first, the act of mercy of whatever kind. The second, the word of mercy. If I cannot carry out a work of mercy, I will assist by my words. The third, prayer. If I cannot show mercy by deeds or words, I can always do so by prayer. My prayer reaches out even there where I cannot reach out physically. We need one another in the body of Christ. Now let's hear a little bit more from our good friend, Father Apostoli, God rest his soul, about plenary indulgences. One of the conditions to gain a plenary indulgence is to have no attachment to sin. But when you get tempted, even though you don't want it, you still have an attachment to that sin, okay? So how can you be without any attachment to sin, you know, and get that full plenary indulgence if that's necessary? Well, I'll try to explain it as best I can. We have to make a distinction 
between an attraction and an attachment, okay? See, attraction, God put certain attractions in our human nature for certain things that give us pleasure. For example, God knows we have to eat. So what did he do? He put pleasure in food that we eat, okay? So we are attracted to that, okay? Um, there's no sin in that attraction of itself. God put it there. The same thing, God wanted couples to engage in sexual relations in their marriages, bring forth new children, you know. And therefore, he put a very strong sexual pleasure in the act of a couple having their sexual relations. So obviously, that couple is going to be attracted to that pleasure so that uh, in their married life, they would come together as husband and wife and conceive and bring forth uh, new children into the world. Huh? So there is an attraction to certain things, the food, the sexual pleasure, okay? And, um, and so attraction then uh, is, is uh, placed, placed there by God. And if that attraction is properly ordered, huh, it's something good. It's part of our human nature, the attraction, okay? On the other hand, there's attachment, what is that? Okay, attachment actually is a disordered, a disorder. In other words, the attraction we have, uh, you know, if we use it according to God's will, is ordered in the proper way. Attachment, on the other hand, is when everything is out of order, okay? It's contrary to God's will, see? That is not good, and that's what attachment is. Now let's meet a Marian Helper. This is one of my right-hand men here at the Association of Marian Helper, a great family man, a great Catholic, and a great overall person. This is Zeke Chichester. Um, my name is Zeke. I've, I'm married, have three wonderful kids, and a wonderful wife. I've been with the Marians 19 years at this point. So I grew up with a you know, Orthodox Catholic family and we were always up here on and off for Mercy Sunday and similar activities. And my mom used to actually be in charge of the prayer line for a decent while when I was in my teens and later. I was looking for a, uh, essentially a side job while doing other projects and started working here and I just really liked the people and I ended up staying a while. Um, I work as a uh, an analyst so I make sure that we are responsible in the way we use you know our donors funds and I've, I get involved with a lot of the mailings and stuff like that and all sorts of fun projects from web design to ebooks to everything else in existence. I am obsessive compulsive about numbers and stuff. So since I was like a late teen, like as soon as I got Excel, I was using it and playing with it. And I get to do that as a job, which is great. The number side of things is a bit drier than most for most people, but in a very real sense, I get to like help with our, you know, our mailing efforts, our all the efforts we do to reach people in these various avenues. Albeit most people aren't particularly interested in ratios and numbers involved, it's you're keeping track of it and making sure it goes everything goes smoothly and we do things the way we're supposed to. And it's it's just nice doing it for a group that's actually doing something worthwhile, as opposed to, you know, some random bank or whoever else. I'm definitely passionate about my job. I mean it's I mean indirectly it's helping the ministry of the Marians and all these things, and it's good having a cause like that. I do also really love the fact that I have the opportunity to do it, but it's it's nice doing it for a good cause and for their supporting the ministry and plus getting involved in all the other little odds and ends we do. So, probably the one that speaks to me the most would be the kind of like the focus on like praying for people and souls, partially because my parents were always doing that and. My mom was running the prayer line, so she definitely <laughs> stood by that you know, philosophy. Uh, 
St. Stan, because he has a glorious bald spot. In the evening, after Vespers, I went to the cemetery in the Sisters Park. I had been praying for a while when I saw one of our sisters who said to me, we are in the chapel. I understood that I was to go to the chapel and there pray and gain the indulgences. The next day, during Holy Mass, I saw three white doves soaring from the altar toward heaven. I understood that not only the three souls that I saw had gone to heaven, but also many others who had died beyond the confines of our institute. Oh, how good and merciful is the Lord. When the soul of a certain young lady came to me one night, she made me aware of her presence and made known to me that she needed my prayer. I prayed for a while, but her spirit did not leave me. Then I thought to myself, if you are a good spirit, leave me in peace, and the indulgences I will gain tomorrow will be for you. At that moment, the spirit left my room, and I recognized that she was in purgatory. Well, thank you, everybody, so much for joining us this week on Living Divine Mercy, and please be with us next week as we have a very special and moving tribute and show about September 11th, and from it came the holy name of Mary. So be with us next week to understand a little bit more about God's mercy in the midst of tragedy. And until then, may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.